Great, so Borodai Balb, good morning everybody and thank you very much for the uh, the invitation here. Um, if you could move on to the next slide please Emily. Um, slight hint of irony uh, for me as being asked to do this as I'm actually a light water reactor man so um, I, I'm familiar with P's and B's uh, and not so much gas cooled reactors but hopefully experience from uh, uh, operational plant and um, new build projects will, will, will come in. Uh, I must admit I was a little disheartened listening to, to Lawrence's presentation, a fantastic presentation but I thought oh rats he's going to say everything that, that I had in here but um, uh, I think Lawrence talking about the technical aspects and I'll talk a bit more about the project aspects hopefully those will come together quite nicely for uh, for today's discussion. So can I have the next slide please Emily? So as I mentioned, I'm talking on behalf of the Nuclear Institute. So if you're not a member, we'd love to love to welcome you. And looking down the distinguished cast list, I'm sure uh, I'm sure you could all uh, enter at a, a fellow level. Um, if you'd like to find out more, you can visit nuclearinst.com. Um, lots of lectures, webinars at the moment, and visits when we're able to. So uh, come and join us. We'd we'd love to welcome you. Uh, if you could have the next slide, please, Emily. So Lawrence and, uh, and Joanne have, have also talked a bit about the um, growth of the nuclear industry in the UK and in the early days, in the early 50s and the mid 50s, as we were pursuing our uh, nuclear power program, as, as has been mentioned, of uh, natural uranium gas cooled reactors. Um, there was no nuclear experience in the UK other than that that had been um, active on the Manhattan Project and nuclear research. So the government of the day set about to inject some competition into the market, forming four and then five industrial consortia. And they were all formed around the um, leading industrial companies of the day. So AEI, Charles Parsons, English Electric, um, International Combustion. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working on some of their coal fired boilers um, and the UK General Electric, GEC. Um, each of these, Lawrence, would you mind um, just popping Sorry. yourself on mute, please? No, no problem, Sorry. no problem. And. Um, uh, these consortia all brought their different designs to the to the table. Um, they were their engineers were taught um, nuclear technology and nuclear physics by the UK Atomic Energy Authority. Um, as we've discussed, and Lawrence quite rightly mentioned on the in the the Q and A session that, that that what did seem to go well was that we had a program of reactors to be built. We didn't quite achieve the targets all the time, but we did have a a good program built. With the different consortia though came all the different designs and uh, there wasn't sufficient order book to uh, sustain all the consortia. So as you can see here, it's a, stories of, a story of mergers, acquisitions um, and disappearance of some of these consortia as we went um, through the Nuclear Power Group, United Power, BNDC, um, TNPG through to NNC um, to what now some of the remnants are, are left within what's now Jacobs. Following this, there, there wasn't any sustained build program um, for, uh, after size well B, um, and we were just left with, as I say, the one consortia of AMEC NNC. There were two exports of Magnox reactors to Latina in Italy and Tokai Mura in Japan. There was also one proposed to the um, Rhine-Westphalia Electric Company in Germany uh, and one to a Swiss utility, but it was rumoured at the time that um, pressure to buy the light water reactor technology from uh, the USA had, had put paid to those exports, but exports uh, would have been a good way to help grow that order book as well. So if you we can move on to the next slide, please, Emily. And we look, can look at what's important is that line of sight to a fleet, which we had, we had that line of sight to a fleet, the Magnox reactors. Um, we mentioned how many were built. I think there's about 50, 50 reactors built for um, gas cooled operation across test and research, um, Magnox, uh, and then into the AGR fleet. However, introducing competition into the marketplace, which sounded quite a good idea, brought with it some unintended consequences. So it bought different designs for each of the plants and each of the plants designs was was built upon and, and tweaked and, and fiddled um, in the in, in the name of achieving greater efficiency and greater power output. Um, but in the end, there wasn't sufficient order book to sustain um, such a competitive marketplace. Um, and as we say, this was whittled down to just one. 
Um, looking at the market is very important. Not only what, what's your line of sight to a fleet, but what sort of export potential have you got for your your products, um, which can obviously increase the the, um, the size of the potential fleet that you can deploy. Of course, there are aspects there that you have to look at in terms of different regulatory regimes overseas, um, but you can still make a lot of your technology uh, modular um, and as generic as, as, as possible. And we look at the common design and the evolution. So bringing the four and then five different consortia all bought their different designs. And that continued from the Magnox plant all the way through to the advanced gas cooled reactors as well. There was a report given to Parliament in the 1960s on the costs of the Magnox programme. And this showed that from the original reactors at Calder Hall all the way through to the uh, projected at that time, final reactors at Wilver, the cost of a Magnox reactor had decreased by 55%, and that was over a fleet of 24. If we fast forward a few decades and move on to the ETI nuclear cost drivers project, um, they analysed the numbers and saw that had a twin unit design, follow on from Sizewell B being built, we could have achieved a 50% reduction in cost over just three reactors. I've put three there, it's more likely you get most of the reduction when you build the second reactor. So by having that generic design and rolling it out again and again and again, allows you to get that cost reduction quicker and get your costs, uh, costs down quicker. And we see this with the French fleet. We mentioned the French um, three loop PWR fleets. They tend to build in tranches. So you'll have one tranche of three loop, then you'll have a tranche of four loop and, uh, and moving on. Seems to have faltered a little bit with the EPR, but that's that's where we've got to um, at the moment. Could I have the next slide, please, Emily? In the early days um, of the Magnox programme, the choice to go with CO2 cooling was um, because we had difficulty obtaining helium, um, primarily from the US. It was too expensive. It was difficult to get hold of. Um, and we switched to carbon dioxide coolant. Imagine that I always like to think, imagine that what had happened if we had been able to get helium right from the, uh, right from the very start of the programme. Might have been a very interesting uh, cha change in events now. Um, we did uh, sort the supply of helium um, further on in the programme, but by the time um, we had, the UK had decided to press on with carbon dioxide cooling because it had some experience um, and had started the design work. We did have trouble in the early Magnox reactors getting up to the temperatures that we needed to. So a lot of the early units were, were derated in terms of temperature and therefore power uh, to keep below 400 degrees centigrade. And a design review in switching uh, across uh, coolant from helium to, to carbon dioxide missed, uh, missed a few areas, in particular um, some key bolts in the reactors which resulted in shutdowns, amongst many other things that resulted in shutdowns. And interestingly, Dungeon SB um, and Hartlepool were designed to have replaceable boilers, although these, these features weren't fitted as, as we got there, they weren't designed to have that. So I think what can we learn for, for plants going forward is to look at everything in your fuel and your supply chain. I think, Dave, you mentioned this previously on looking at the whole fuel cycle. Uh, I'd agree, looking at all your uh, raw materials, um, your supply chains, where you're going to source things from and make sure they're as robust as they can be. Uh, you also need to carefully look and control your design. Um, this might seem common sense, particularly nowadays, but it's, it is very easy to overlook things. Uh, and I think for me, uh, this is a, a tip towards uh, modular build as well, is, is looking at your design and looking at life limiting components. So interesting to see that replaceable boilers were proposed. Presumably, somebody on the uh, call might be able to tell us exactly why. Presumably, because they thought that might be the life limiting components. Now, when you look at the graphite loss across the reactor cores, you can see that might not necessarily have been the case. So looking at that and what can you do in terms of modularity? Particularly if you look at the um, PWRs and BWRs now, you've got designs where you can replace almost everything except the reactor pressure vessel. And then you go to the can-dos um, in Canada, which are, well, I always refer to them as triggers broom reactors. You can replace every, almost all the components of them uh, in them with the exception of the, uh, of, of the concrete foundations. And if we can move on to the next slide, please, Emily. 
So building on the Magnox program, in, uh, in, uh, in early 1962, Wagger, or the Windscale Advanced Gas Cooled Reactor, started commercial opera uh, started operation. I always think a commercial operation coming from utilities. Um, and this was a 100 megawatts thermal reactor. This was built up at Sellafield, have the pleasure of walking around it. Um, and uh, from Wagger, a lot of um, data and, and useful knowledge was obtained. Uh, following Wagger, the first AGR at Dungeness B was proposed, and I'll come back to that a bit in a second. But in May 1965, the CGB published a report that was titled An Appraisal of the Technical and Economic Aspects of Dungeness B Nuclear Plant. At the time, as, is, uh, as has been said uh, uh, here, um, CGB, UKAA and government were in fierce discussions over what technology should, should proceed. And the CGB study looked at a coal-fired power station at Cotton, which is, uh, I believe, is just is been announced to close. Um, and it looked at the projected costs of an AGR and the projected costs of a boiling water reactor technology from America. So you can see the costs here. There's very, very little in it. Um, I'm told a D is a, an old penny. Um, so. Based on these studies, the CEGB pushed forward with the AGR design. This study, however, was based on onload refueling at full power for the AGR fleet, something which we now know um, doesn't happen. Um, if we do do onload refueling for some of the designs, it's at low power. Um, and it was also to be proven, um, choosing my words very carefully here, uh, it was chosen it was also proven not to uh, not not to have been realised when the Dungeness B, uh, first of a kind of the AGR fleet, came in at about five times the original cost estimate, took 17 years to build, and the output had to be reduced by 20%. Now, some commentators speculate that the leap from the Wagger at 100 megawatts thermal to a core, which was almost 10 times the size of that, was was, was too great and that we should have done things in between um, to try to address that. Um, and then as we move forward in the program, by 1974, the AGR costs, these were in 1974 pounds, were 900 million pounds higher than the original 625 million pound estimate. So we could have the next slide, please, uh, Emily. Uh, we've talked about steam generating heavy water reactor uh, and we've talked about um, PWRs. So this is from a great book. Uh, I managed to, uh, to to secure it on eBay. Um, I do get in trouble for some of my eBay purchases, but Nuclear Power uh, by R.L. Pocock um, is, is well worth a read, uh, along with a couple of others. Um, by 1973, Arthur Hawkins, the then chair of the CEGB, was, was uh, reportedly saying that the steam generating heavy water reactor technology was out of date. It was reported that the CEGB favoured HTGR technology, and you've heard about the proposal for Oldbury B for a large scale high temperature gas reactor, and a lot of the original fuel assemblies that would have been um, put into Oldbury B were tested on the Zenith Zero Power um, high temperature gas reactor test reactor. Um, but only if government would finance the first of a kind. Um, one would assume that that's uh, coming out of the Dungeness experience, which about the time would have been starting to materialise. Uh, and Arthur Hawkins, I've, I've, I've clipped the quote here, otherwise it would have taken up most of the slide, stated the need for a uh, rather interesting choice of words, a bread and butter nuclear power plant, um, as proven as it can be. Um, and as has been said in uh, 1977, then Secretary of Energy Tony Benn uh, recommended um, canning the steam generator heavy water reactors and proceeding with AGRs and PWRs, uh, which resulted later that in the following year, um, AGRs being ordered for Torness uh, and a PWR for size well B. Still moving on, so into 1979 with the Thatcher administration and Energy Secretary Howell, um, they confirmed that CGB would order a Westinghouse PWR based upon the Trojan plant in the US. This was uh, based on, it was going to be based on the Zion plant, which is now in decommissioning, then the Trojan plant, which I don't think was ever built, and then it was switched to the SNUPS, the Standardised Nuclear Unit Power Plant System uh, that had been used at the Callaway plant um, and was similar to isn't that always the way? I forget the name. There's a, a plant in South Carolina that's very similar, but a four-loop Westinghouse PWR. 
Um, by this time, the AGR program and the cost for the AGRs at Hisham and Torness had risen from two to two point eight billion pounds um, in that year, and Torness's costs alone had increased from about seven hundred and forty-two million in nineteen seventy-eight to just over a billion in nineteen eighty. So, what can we learn from this? Well, if we move on to the next slide, please, Emily. we can see that the development program is key particularly i think when you get to um, private industry and attracting private investment so the evolution from research and development we've talked about materials test reactors uh, we talk about first of a kind through to nth of a kind is is absolutely key have you got the data you need are you making the steps that you need keep it nice and simple and I'll come back to why I talk about that later. And then I think you can see from some of the early reports and the decisions we've made, uh, and I forget who mentioned previously about the um, looking at your assumptions on what you base your decisions is to make sure they are as robust as you can possibly make them. And I think what the, P, the entrance of the PWR into the UK market and around the world has shown us is that when a proven low cost solution arrives and size well B was built more or less to time and to budget, the market will likely push forward and deploy it, which will mean that the rest of the technologies are likely to be uh, sidelined. And if we could have the final slide, please, Emily. So what else can we learn from, from the gas cooled fleet? Well, in the UK, we've amassed, it's, it's, quite, it's quite phenomenal when you look back and see it, 60 years of expertise of cradle to grave at gas cooled reactors from design, construction, cost estimation, operation, decommissioning, and as we've heard from Dragon, the eventual dismantlement. We've got a large, uh, I, I use the words, I deliberately had little t and little d here because to me a design authority means something specific, but we have that body of knowledge um, in the UK for gas cooled reactor operations and maintenance. We've got significant intellectual capacity, not just across our operating companies, across government, but our regulators and our supply chain has also built that up as well. I think it was Joanne mentioned the R5 codes, so we've got unique knowledge of codes and their application to materials at high temperature in a nuclear environment. Um, something that might not seem um, particularly important, but the application of technical specifications, um, we'd know them as, as operating rules sort of in the UK, um, as applied to a gas cooled fleet. And we understand what the reactor life limiting components for gas cooled reactors are. So I'll leave you there and uh, pass you back to Simon.